Hey there, and welcome. I'm Anna Hartman, and this is Unreal Results, a podcast where I help you get better outcomes and gain the confidence that you can help anyone, even the most complex cases. Join me as I teach about the influence of the visceral organs and the nervous system on movement, pain, and injuries, all while shifting the paradigm of what whole body assessment and treatment really looks like. I'm glad you're here. Let's dive in. Hello, hello. Welcome back to another episode of the Unreal Results Podcast. I got a friend on today, which I'm so excited for. Um, as you may or may not know, um, I don't typically regularly do regularly do guest episodes unless it's a guest that I really want the world to like know about. And um, that's how I feel about Sarah. So I've gotten a couple questions recently about um, traditional Chinese medicine stuff. And so I was like, I would like to bring Sarah on the podcast because she is my go-to on everything traditional Chinese medicine and acupuncture and all the things incorporated under that bubble. And so that's that's where we're at. And I've I've actually known Sarah for like 20 20. 20 years like right yeah. around 20 years I was yeah. my sister's like I was telling her you're coming on the podcast today and she's like oh the name sounds familiar and I was like um she was a strength and conditioning intern at exos back in the day her brother was one of my athletes like yeah. we got tattoos together that's <laughs> right oh my god Tomorrow together <laughs> that's right oh the tattoos oh yeah. that's right yeah. history together and my sister was like oh yeah, okay, uh-huh. I who that is. So, so, anyways, so welcome to uh, my podcast, Sarah. Um, I would love for you to introduce yourself. So, Dr. Sarah Asadorian. Thanks, take Anna. Away. Thank you. I'm psyched to be here. I have to, and I'm not just saying this, but your podcast is one of my favorites. Um, hey. You know, I'm not just saying that because you're my friend and I've <laughs> known you for 20 years, but yeah. you, you know, we call you Yoda for a reason. You know, you're always you're always consistently putting out amazing, brilliant content. And I'm just honored that you invited me on today. So thank yeah. you. You're welcome. Yeah. I'm so glad yeah. you're here. And it's funny, too, because I like just looking at your background. So Sarah got this yeah. um, LED light put up one day and I was like, shut the front door. And I <laughs> sent her a picture and I literally have this, not all of it, but because I couldn't afford the whole LED shout out, shout out. They're expensive. Um, yeah. They're not so cheap. I only got the um, last part of it. I have feel more on my wall mm-hmm. as well in my office. So I was like, of yeah. course you got that. This is I know. And, like, and we like, didn't even plan it that way. We didn't even plan it. No. And this is this is where I'm just like, this is why I love Sarah, because we've all we've always been on the same page. And <laughs> this is also why I love it's really cool when you are working with a fellow practitioner that practices with a different tool set, but you arrive at the same sort of conclusion about the patient in front of you. And like that's just I love that so much. And so often that happens between us and you Mm -hmm. know for the like also just like full transparency a lot of times Sarah is who I call when I need help with patient either like I get to like I'm stuck or I'm like need more ideas or even like if it's a patient in Arizona that I can't put my hands on and I want some good quality hands and like a you know very holistic technique I refer them to Sarah quite a bit so yeah yeah. yeah. It wasn't surprising you, that we had the same LED mantra on our walls. <laughs> I know. It, it's really not surprising. But honestly, it's the truth, right? We need to feel more. Um, yeah. Think let, we got to get out of our heads and into our bodies, right? Yeah. That's that's the future. That's where the good stuff is, right? Within. That's and, my, um, my favorite quote from Jill Miller, the founder of Tune Up Fitness, um, is the body thinks and feels. And I was like, ah, that's so yes. good. That is so yeah. great. Thanks and and thank God for Jill too, right? I yeah. I haven't had the privilege yet to learn directly from her, but I have her books. I follow her. I've been following her for years, and yeah. uh, I was actually I was signed up to take one of her courses in May of 2020, and of course it got canceled with you know COVID and everything. But um, you know her work and everything that she talks about thinking and feels. I just I, it's just it's brilliant. Thank God, thank God for her. <laughs> yeah. 
It is yeah. Amazing. But one thing I want to highlight that you just said, Anna, is, you know, there's a lot of different ways to get to a certain result, right? There's, there's, um, and that I think is overlooked. I think we, a, a lot of practitioners, trainers, coaches, therapists, clinicians, like we get so caught up in our own little world and our own little way of thinking that we forget there is a million ways to skin the cat, right? There's yeah. a lot of different avenues. There's different ways to get to, uh, you know, a positive result and right. And, uh, you know, what I appreciate for, from you again is, you know, it's always a good feeling when you call me and say, Hey, <laughs> I'm stuck. I need, I'm like, really Anna stuck? Like, okay, I got to put on my, my acupuncture hat and, you know, try to come at this from a different angle. But whatever it is, it usually clears up right away. And it's yep. just like, you know, I call this surrounding the dragon. Chinese medicine, we have a lot of really cool terminology, right? And surrounding the dragon is one of my favorites. And um, what that is, is basically like, it's a needle technique, right? We use, we replace needles all the way around the perimeter of a target, right? So I use it a lot for scar tissue, lacerations, you know, um, that kind of thing. And when we come around, when we surround the dragon, we come around an issue from all angles, right? Top, bottom, you know, angle, just we surround it. Right. And I, t I take that very much like from a, from a theoretical standpoint and I apply it to everything in my treatment plans and, you know, the conversations that I'm having with my patients, like how can we come at this problem or this challenge and like what angles are we missing? Yeah. What haven't we explored yet, you know? And um, so that's that's one thing that I always appreciate about you too. It's like yeah. you, you you don't discount things that are outside of your specialty and your, uh, you know, I take that and I run with it. So yeah. thank you for that no, inspiration. No, I mean, and it's so, I love that. Uh, I just wrote mm -hmm. Dance Around the Dragon because I was like, mm -hmm. oh, I think this is going to be the title of the episode. Because oh, <laughs> yes. Oh, yeah. so good. Yeah, so good. Yeah. Um, yeah, and yeah. it's so true because like the what you described too is like yeah not only doing that with like the target tissue or the target focus but it's like the person right like the athlete centered model is like how can we put the athlete put our patient in the center of every decision that we make like what who they are what they're presenting with what their goals are like you know what they want versus what they need like how can we always keep that centered um and I think when you do keep it centered like that, it's it's inevitable that you realize that you can't like you can't surround them all on your own, right? Like you're only one person, and it's hard to surround an entire another human being without a whole team of people. And right, exactly. Whole, you know, it's even too like if you think of like the biopsychosocial model and like the diagrams that often people show with biopsychosocial model is like this circular like Venn diagram and it's like yeah because we have to consider all the parts of what it is to be human when 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 we're considering you know something that's not going optimally with a human so right. I love I do love I mean Chinese like Chinese medicine Chinese you know just culturally the way they describe things like they do have do such a good job of sort of like this imagery of, of, mm -hmm. of giving meaning to 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 things so i love it's that very thing. profound yeah it's yeah. profound it's creative it's um symbolic you know sometimes it sounds a little mystical yeah um but it's it's beautiful it really yeah. is and you know traditional chinese medicine you know i i've been studying for gosh almost almost 15 years now I've been a student yeah. of Chinese medicine and that's barely scratching the surface if you think about it, right. because mm -hmm. there's, there's texts that date acupuncture and China, you know, this, you know, this type of medicine, 5,000 years right. in history, 5,000 years. And that's before they had written language, you know, yeah. like it's, it's pretty vast, Yeah, you know, it's deep and it's wide and it's beautiful. And when I love it too, because it's just, um, well, and this is probably biased because I would say like my whole lifetime, I have been an observer. Like I, you know, it's part of what I think makes me good at figuring out, um, complicated cases and puzzles and stuff it, it, with my patients is that I am like, 
able to like take a lot of information in and like sit with it and like just observe things really well. And I, I think that kind of is like when I think of Chinese medicine, I think of just how robust it is in terms of how they've considered everything and like observed patterns throughout the season in relationship to the organs in relationship to the people's constitution and like you know that kind of thing is like you know what an interesting way that they've always centered the person within nature um yes to to observe the the natural seasons the natural ebbs and flow of the entire system of the body too so that's that's yeah. really that's really cool i guess it is really cool and you bring up a good point too and like using your observation skills yeah. right like that's all they had to go off of 5000 years ago they didn't yeah. have anything they didn't know what the body was they didn't know yeah. you know what they were dealing with they were just kind of looking around and trying to figure things out as they went so all right. they had was their observation skills and mm -hmm. the practitioners at that time you know, at the roots of this medicine, they had no way of writing anything down. So all they did was, you know, they gathered their students and apprentices and they, the, it was their job to remember everything. Yeah. You know, so a lot of the roots of this medicine, um, you know, was based solely on presence and yeah. the ability to observe mm -hmm. and put, you know, put the pieces together. And there was no separation between human and nature really right right because we took they took the stars into account the sun yeah. the the weather the environment animals yeah. too right plants mm -hmm. herbs like there is uh it's a really vast and deep deep medicine yeah. and i think that's one of the reasons why it, it's withstood the test of time mm -hmm. you know and here I mean, like here we are it's interesting too because like fundamentally that is like being a scientist mm -hmm. is observation like paying attention to something, providing a little stimulus or intervention or like, you know, or just noting like, oh, interesting. After, after you add this, after you add sugar, like this is what the response is. And not only observing that in one person, but like starting to see patterns of that in multiple people. Yes. And um, I think <laughs> this is a whole nother rabbit hole we don't have to talk about but it's just always interesting to me because I always in I always go back to like the evidence-based practice trolls and I'm like you're forgetting <laughs> what fundamental science was like you're forgetting right. what you learned as a fifth grader of like creating a science project is having a hypothesis and observing and doing something and observing the change and either no, you know, deciding did that support my hypothesis or did it not? And then also the understanding that any scientific model that's been put out there, the whole purpose of putting a scientific model out is to prove it wrong. Right. And so, right. Anyways, it, it's just, and, it, and again, it comes back even more to the mantra of the feeling more is the reason why people have a hard time fundamentally with the observation piece and the recognizing patterns and the, and being curious and allowing the body to sort of speak to them is that they are so disconnected from what they're feeling in their own bodies. Like they can't, they're like, they're so used to just thinking their way through life that they've disconnected from the feeling and the feeling is actually what provides the observation and the curiosity and all the things. So, right. Yeah. Yeah. Their attention just goes right outside their body. Mm -hmm. Right. It goes outside to an external source. Yeah. And uh, all the answers are within. Right. Yeah. They're all in the fields. Yeah. They're all, all they're the all field. inside. And we're all I mean, that's I think the direction we're all heading is within. Right. Our yeah. answers to everything is already inside of all of us. Yeah. So we the more we can get realigned and pick up on all the fields, the faster we're all going to get there. Absolutely. You know, and we're all the same on the inside. Right. Yeah. Like. Yeah. That's that's unity. If we can all mm -hmm. develop that skill of alignment and listening, yeah. the faster we're all just going to start getting along and everybody's going to yeah. love each other. And, you know, let's get that going, Isn't right? Isn't that the truth? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> um, so I don't want to be taken down this wonderful rabbit hole that we're going down, which I love it. Mm -hmm. But I also yeah. want to um, 
I also want to get in a little bit of the nuts and bolts of the Chinese medicine and, and mm-hmm. the connection to the visceral organs and maybe the emotions and the musculoskeletal pieces of it mm-hmm. and toss a little bit. Of, well, so the question that came up that made me be like, yeah, I need to bring Sarah on the podcast to talk about Chinese medicine because I always sort of touch on it whenever I talk mm-hmm. about the viscera. And this is what I love about the Baral Institute is he's noticed these patterns too. He's pulled from Chinese medicine and recognized that it's been around forever. And so he <laughs> too sees these patterns, right? And so, you know, without us sometimes really realizing it when we go through their teachings, we're, we're learning a lot of what he learned from, you know, however he learned some Chinese medicine stuff. So, sure. Um, you know, and it comes up a lot. I sh- whenever I share about the organs, I try to like give all the information in terms of like the emotions associated with the organs, which is very, very pulled from Chinese medicine, um, both Chinese medicine and Ayurvedic medicine, which are you know have a lot of similarities to Similar, it. Similar, yep. Mm-hmm. And then also, um, also because I'd say sort of like. You know, my big, I don't want to say shtick, but my big thing with teaching people the LTAP, the locator test assessment protocol, is that it doesn't really matter if you're trained in visceral manipulation or even acupuncture or like any sort, like it doesn't matter if you know how to treat that exact organ or that exact point or meridian or like have a specific tool to treat it with, like acupuncture or visceral manipulation, because if you're in the area where the body is protecting, right, if you've targeted the right organ or the right vessel or the right joint or right muscle for that matter, you can do anything in that area and you're going to get a good response. And so basically I have taken my understanding of visceral anatomy and learned the visceral manipulation technique, but then also been like, oh, but I also know this movement of the body in this area that if, if the, if the peritoneum and the suspensory ligaments attached to the, this rib and that spine and this part of the fascia, like it, you know, I'm virtually doing treatment from a movement standpoint. And so since I've introduced these more visceral based movement concepts, um, that I've either created on my own or pulled from other practitioners, um, that I've learned from, people inevitably has asked have asked me is this similar to qigong or is this similar to tai chi and and i don't know enough about those practices to answer it well enough i know they're connected um and so that's one of the main reasons i wanted to bring you on is so you can kind of speak to that because um obviously movement is a big part of your practice for yourself and for your patients. <laughs> and um, since you're familiar with those movement modalities, I would love to hear how you describe them in general and then how they're connected to the visceral mo- mobility pieces or the visceral yeah. function pieces. Yeah. So, I mean, m- movement is a huge part of, of what I do and, and you as well, right? And uh, we can't have movement without breath right? We, I think we both can agree yeah. with that. Like movement is always better when breath is synchronized. Mm-hmm. And the thing that I think ties both Tai Chi and Qigong together is that uh, awareness of syncing breath with movement. So I think in, in that way, these two disciplines are very, very similar. Um, Qigong, I typically use with my patients to stimulate more of like a like an internal change of energy or visceral function. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'll start, you know, I'll just start, just put that right there. With, with Tai Chi, it's, it really is a, it's a combat martial art, believe it or not, right? And I, and I, you know, my teachers that I've learned Tai Chi from are the experts, you know? So I'm not right. going to sit here and pretend like I'm a, you know, a Tai Chi expert or, you know, a martial art expert, I, by no means am, am I that, but, uh, I will use Qigong more from a medicinal standpoint and I will use uh, Tai Chi more from a, like a coordination movement development Mm -hmm. type of approach. Yeah. So with Qigong being more 
organ related, um, the movements that that are typically performed follow, uh, I would say, the Chinese medicine meridians. If you're familiar with that, I know you are, and I'm sure your your listeners are at, at least a little familiar with that. But um, you know, yeah. if they read um, Anatomy Trains, they've they've yeah. similar. You know, mm-hmm. yeah, they're they're familiar with that. So. Um, you know, synchronizing breath with movement and uh, breathing and moving in such a way that stimulates organ function through uh, these patterns of energy and these patterns of, you know, fascial, fascia, the fascial trains. Uh, you know, I think there's, there's a lot of use. There's a lot of benefit. There's a lot of utility in, yeah. in Qigong and, and Tai Chi. I don't know if that was yeah, no, a good I think answer that's good or not. I mean, before I learned about visceral connections to movement and to the musculoskeletal system. I think in traditional physical therapy and athletic training and strength and conditioning practice, you learn how Qigong is help, is great for the geriatric population because it is gentle movements and, you know, slow movements and, um, you know, and so I think sometimes it gets categorized as like, only for those people. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I'm like, actually, no, it can be like, you know, that it's almost like saying yoga should only be for old people for the same reasons. But it's like, we right. all know that yoga is great for everyone, right? Everybody. Like, yeah. Thing, like understanding that there are practice, movement practices out there like Qigong that are very supportive to our health and have a lot of intention behind the positions and the patterns and the way it goes about doing things. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I would challenge those people who say that Qigong is just for, you know, geriatric populations because it's not that easy. And those folks, like, you know, especially if we take it like an athletic population who's used to going, you know, bigger, stronger, faster, going hard all the time in the gym, like how easy is it for them to slow down? Yeah. It's probably one of the more challenging things that they're, they're, uh, they're going to be faced with. So, you know, it's it's for everybody, really, especially I would say the uh, the athletic population, mm-hmm. you know, because it 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 presents a challenge that they're probably not uh, tapping into very yeah. often. Slow yeah. down, breathe. Like, how is your coordination? <laughs> you know, yeah. uh, how 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 slow are you willing to let your body go, and right. how much attention can you pull into your body? Like, that's not easy to do. Mm-mm. So. I would I love encourage that. So people to. Here's a question for you. So, like, mm-hmm. obviously, the liver comes up a lot in for everyone needs support mm-hmm. with the liver. Um, yep. And if I were to give, if I were to give someone treatment, if I were to treat the liver, obviously, I'm going right at the liver from a manual therapy standpoint. But I also might go to like T7 through T9 on the spine, or I also might support some sort of. Um, rotation thoracolumbar rotation or maybe even side bending mm-hmm. or like really any movement around the thoracolumbar junction so depending on like what mobility is limited or like what direction the liver is not moving i might get a little bit more intentional with it but um how would you from a chinese medicine or like qigong standpoint from for a liver a person who needed support of the liver what would that potentially look like because <laughs> Maybe I'm mistaken, and maybe you can walk us through this, but just because someone needs support to their liver doesn't mean it's a liver meridian. It might be a different meridian, right, that supports the liver. Absolutely. I mean, there's there's relationships uh, between all of the organs, right? So right. the liver will interact with each you know, other organ in it, their own way. They'll support each other, right, in this reciprocal way. But uh, to keep it pretty basic, the liver right. and the gallbladder are yin and yang pairs. Mm-hmm. Right. So, you know, always I would consider what's happening in the gallbladder just because of its close relationship in right. physical proximity, but also from an energetic standpoint uh, mm-hmm. to to the liver. From a Qigong standpoint, what I would do is um, I would do uh, like a tapping technique. I would just start mm-hmm. with, you know, kind of just starting in a flex position, starting at the uh, the beginning of the liver meridian, which is on the, the big toe. Mm -hmm. Um, and just following the meridian just by tapping, coming all the way up the, uh, just 
medial just just off midline of the medial aspect of uh, of the lower legs of the limbs mm -hmm. coming all the way up, and then once you get to the hips, I would I would probably if I could stand up and give the demo. Can I do that? Yeah. Yeah, I, I don't course. know if you can see me there, but if you come if you come up, you know the 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 liver meridian is again just medial to the uh, to the midline. Once you get to the hips, now you come out to the side. Now you're following the gallbladder meridian all the way down. Um, down the lateral aspects of um, of the leg down to the pinky. So we're just, we're stimulating um, uh, energy flow. We're stimulating these meridians to move. Um, mm -hmm. And we're actually just by doing that, just through this tapping and the, and the breath work and just the movement, we're just, we're highlighting the brain's attention to these particular areas. So if there's yeah. any stagnation, if there's any, um, you know, any congestion in terms of energy, in terms of blood, in terms of even lymph, right? Mm -hmm. um, there will be, uh, you know, that, uh, that stimulation of flow there. So whatever you're doing, that type of movement and, uh, and breath work with a little bit of tapping, a little bit of guidance um, to guide your brain's attention to th those particular yeah. meridians, I think will go a long way. That, that's interesting. So with those meridians, you know, I'm obviously familiar that the meridians exist and I know how to look sure. them up in a book or yeah. on the Google. Um, but so you demonstrated how they are in the lower extremity. Do those extend through the trunk and the arms too, or do those are only in the lower extremity? Yeah. Yeah. So um, the liver, let's see. So the liver is going to come up the midline, just, mm -hmm. just off, uh, off the, uh, off center and the gallbladder yeah. meridian is actually one of the larger meridians in the body. Oh, so it'll start, um, at the eye and it comes up around the skull and it goes all the way down the lateral aspect of the body and ends on mm -hmm. the, the pinky toe. So, so yes. Kind of like so spiral line and anatomy trains. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Um, so it's, uh, I mean, the, the any kind of one would be like the deep frontal line, deep frontal. Yeah. Deep front. Yep. Exactly. So like you mentioned before, you know, flexion, extension, rotation, side bending of the spine, like any spinal uh, mobility, any, any, of, any of that kind of intervention will be beneficial. Yeah. yeah. So it's interesting. One of my favorite movements for the liver specifically is the da Vinci rolling patterns that I got from Philip Beach. Mm -hmm. And it makes sense too, kind of what you said of the liver meridians, because the liver meridian, it sounds like, as it goes through the trunk, is a little bit similar to the borders of the helical field, which would also be the nipple line on mammals. And so he talks about how important, like, mobilizing the, the nipple line is because it's our fluid field. Um, so, but the interesting thing, too, if, if I break down Da Vinci rolling, it's also a rotational pattern. So it's getting that spiral line. So there's the gallbladder connection into it. Yep. Too. So, Absolutely. No it's such a powerful a powerful movement. Um, my friend yeah. Daniela Spear, who I had on the podcast, she is um, on Instagram remade. Well, maybe she's just, maybe she's just Daniela Spear on Instagram, but her business okay. is called remade, remade wellness. She has autoimmune um, coaching for people movement. And um, <clears throat> she swears that she healed her autoimmune um, disease and her liver enzyme function with doing the da Vinci rolling every day. She's like, I swear to God, Anna, it's incredible. Once I added that in, it was like a game changer. So mm -hmm. hit a whole podcast together, which I'll link, but amazing. Uh, yeah. So interesting. It's miraculous. It's miraculous. Um, when, when you were describing that and thank you not to put you on the spot mm -hmm. of like, no, it's okay. the meridian and how yeah. you, <laughs> um, you said a couple of things that of course I'm familiar with, but I don't know if everybody listening is familiar with. So in the sense of, Assuming they're not, I want you to explain it. So you said that the liver and the gallbladder were yin and yang for, you know, so yin and yang pairs that yep. in from an energy mm -hmm. standpoint. And then also just made me think of like the fact that the term qigong, many people might not know that qi is like the Chinese word for energy. Right. Um, or maybe it's not. Maybe you can explain yeah. it. And then sure. so that made me think of like, well, what does gong mean? So it was that what does qigong necessarily translate? You know what? Um, I don't have the answer to that. Yeah. Chi, well, like, first, like chi, right? energy, well, chi, life force, right? Yeah. It's, it's, right. um, it's, yeah, like it's a, almost in like, um, yeah, yoga. Ki, mm -hmm. like, yeah. Uh, you know, 
chi or chi, they'll, you know, it's all the same explanation for the force that gives life to all living beings, right? Mm -hmm. It's the common denominator between all living beings, right? We have chi in our bodies. We have it surrounding us. We have it in our food. We have it, you know, yeah. every living being like, has chi. It is, and even though like, if, and again, this gets back to like the observation aspect of like the roots of this medicine is all they had to go off of was their observation skills. So they sat back and they, you know, they just observed like, wow, here are humans, here are animals of all these different types of species. Here we have sun, we have moon, we have all these, you know, plants and trees and forests and all these things. They're all living, they're all thriving. And right. yet we, we all take such different forms, but here we are coexisting. We're right. all like, we're here together yeah, somehow. we are all atoms, basically. Yeah. Ex yes. Well, they didn't know that at the time, but yes. Yeah. <laughs> and so there has to be some force. There's something that we can't physically see that ties us all together. There's something. Yeah. And, you know, life force, chi is that thing. Mm -hmm. And um, it's, a, it's a really beautiful concept. And, and um, you know, chi moves through us. It's, it's uh, talking about yin and yang pairs, equal opposites. Mm -hmm. um, chi and blood are yin and yang pairs. So it's a beautiful thing that within the body, our blood is what moves our chi with blood being a yin sub a substance. And chi is the action base. It's our energy um, that makes the blood move. So it's this beautiful, you know, you know, reciprocal relationship where blood will deliver chi to the body. Yeah. And chi is what moves the blood. So it's, you know, kind of a, it's just a, a beautiful thing to me, but just to get into yeah. the, the yin and yang pairs, right? Everything is equal opposites, yin and yang. Um, it's, I, a lot of times I'll talk to my patients and I'll liken it to the, uh, the autonomic nervous system where we have a sympathetic and parasympathetic, you know, dominant state. What, at any given time, one is going to be more dominant the, uh, at, than the other, um, but they're always both running. They're always both yeah. and they need you know, present. Correctly. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. We need to be able to flow. And if we if we think about that yin and yang, that Tai Chi symbol, right? The circle with the, you know, the, yeah. uh, the line down the middle and then the two, the two uh, circles within the bigger circles, right? There's always a little bit of one within the other. Um, there's never one, any given moment where we're all yin or all yang. It's this right. beautiful, you know, yeah, it's flow never of like, equal opposites. Yeah. It's like... <laughs> Even though it's like equal, it's mm -hmm. not necessarily always half and half. <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. That's what, that, that's what that symbol looks like to me. It's like, well, technically it is half and half, but it's not always clearly half and half. Right. Exactly. There's going to be a little bit of uh, dominance in one or the other. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And wherever you fall, and we'll all fall within that, you know, that circle uh, at any given time. Right. Like, well, there, there are yin times of day and yang times of day, right? So the yin well, time of day is when the, the sun... I can say that's a good yes. entrance into the organ clock too. So Yes, yeah, to... exactly. Yeah, so um, so the yin time of day, it's going to be nighttime where it's dark and we go within, right? We go to sleep. It's time to rest and recover. That's a very yin thing to do is to go within. Yang time of day, it's a, when the sun is out. It's our active time of day typically, right? I know there are some yeah. people that that work a, a an opposite uh you know schedule yeah. sometimes they yeah. work at night as opposed to working during the day but this is um you know our rhythms and everything were designed uh to follow this time of day we're we're most active we're most uh you know all of our output happens during the daytime when it's light out during that young yeah. time of day yin is uh, again that that nighttime more more restful regenerative inward yeah. type of uh existence so um, equal opposites. So where was I going with that? Yeah. So yeah, oh, back, back to the, uh, the, uh, paired organs. So in the Chinese medicine system, each organ will have a yin and yang pair, right? Cause there's never, we, we can't have one without the other, right? So the liver and the gallbladder go together where, um, you know, the stomach and the spleen, they go together, right? Mm -hmm. The stomach, uh, being that yang hollow organ, and the spleen is more of that, uh, the, the, uh, the fluid mover, right? Mm -hmm. It's more of a solid uh, organ, right? Um, that's, that's another thing, um, hollow versus solid, mm -hmm. right? Um, 
you know, equal opposites again. Yeah. So we see this, this, uh, this repetitiveness of yin and yang throughout the body and throughout, throughout all of our systems. Um, and it's just, we're kind of always finding these balances. So within these, um, Chinese medicine paired organs, there's patterns that follow. And in that, in those patterns, there are times of day associated with them. There are emotions that are tied with them, both um, balanced, I'll say, balanced emotions and imbalanced emotions. Um, there's elements too. So nature elements. So we have fire, we have earth, we have metal, water, and wood. Yeah. And um, the liver and the gallbladder, I'll just touch on this a little bit. This is actually um, really interesting is that the, the liver and the gallbladder is the wood element and it's all about growth. And, um, if you can imagine, you know, a tree with all the branches, you know, that are going in all the different directions and, you know, blowing in the wind, uh, makes the tree stronger, right? That adversity that the, that wood has to face it, you know, it, it, it challenges the strength of, mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, of the, uh, the tree, right? The strength mm -hmm. of the tree. And the emotion that is tied uh, to the gallbladder in particular is uh, uh, decisiveness. Mm. And so when there's a imbalance in this liver and gallbladder, um, we might see things like indecision. Mm. We might see someone just growing for the sake of growing, like, like that tree that isn't uh, kept Right. If you, you never right. have the landscaper come and trim down, you know, the branches and all the things, they just grow in all the different directions, all haphazardly growing for the sake of growing with no direction, really. Yeah. So that wood meridian or that wood uh, relationship is, I would say, kept in check by the metal pair, right? The wood and the metal, which is the lung and the large intestine, which mm -hmm. is very much more about, uh, like military style order, um, keeping things organized. And so it's like the, all these organ pairs, yes, we need to grow in that liver and that gallbladder and that wood, we need to grow. We need to expand. We need to, um, make decisions and act in correspondence to that, but we can't do anything without the order that the metal elements bring us, right? Yeah. We can't, we, you know, it prevents us from growing out of control without any direction. So that, mm -hmm. that lung and large intestine, yin and yang pair, that metal um, really delivers some organization. And so when we see these things, these patterns show up in our patients, um, you know, they might have pain somewhere along the line of the liver and the gallbladder. Um, but as we get into more asking about how their mindset is, what their behaviors are like, um, even like what flavors of food are they, uh, mm -hmm. uh, craving, right? All of those things have an association with these, these, uh, elements and these, these yin and yang pairs. So when we're coming up on a, you know, coming up on a treatment plan, well, we know what points are, are going to be best for this person, but we also know what, uh, like mindset work needs to be done. Mm -hmm. What coaching do we need to do around, you know, uh, you know whatever their pattern is. So if it's someone who's growing just for the sake of growing and they're very livery, they're gallbladdery, you know, they're not making decisions, but, and they're frustrated and they're angry and they don't really know what they're doing or how they're doing it. Well, maybe we need to look into some lung and large intestine stuff to see if there's any deficiencies there. Is it right. that the liver and the gallbladder are overworking? Are they too, are they too much? Are they in excess or is there not enough of the, um, the metal element, the lung and the large intestine? to kind of keep the wood in check. So, True. and that type of uh, distinction will, will really drive the treatment plan. So if you're, you know, a liver in excess, um, that treatment will look a certain way. But if you're experiencing these symptoms because of a, a deficiency in your lung and, or yeah, in your lung and your large intestine, well, that treatment's going to look a lot different. You were going to do yeah. an entirely different set of points. So getting into all the details in terms of um, not just the musculoskeletal, what they're fi fi feeling physically, but yeah. the mindset, the emotions, um, the nutrition, the, uh, the repetitive thoughts that they're having, their, the strategies that they're implementing in their behaviors and their lifestyle, all of that matters. Yeah. And it's all about just kind of, um, from my standpoint as a practitioner, identifying what these patterns are and, and how much in one 
or two meridians are they uh, are they operating right? Are the, are you too much here or are you too too little here or is it both? Right. You know. So uh, I don't know if that was confusing or too much, no, but it's, it's really interesting. Obviously, it always mm-hmm. really, like adds to like hearing you explain it and hearing you talk about the relationships like that. It just makes mm-hmm. me have more questions. <laughs> yeah, I know. Like, oh, and I'm that's really just and that. that yeah, and this is just one style of acupuncture. Yeah. Right. Like there's a lot of different styles of acupuncture that exist. And that's something that I don't think a lot of people realize is that not all acupuncture is the same. So when we talk about these primary primary meridians and these organ pairs, that's just one school of thought. Yeah. And that's that's different from the style that I typically practice here in my my clinic. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. That's, you know, channel theory is what you know, ch- channel theory and, and five element theory where they mm-hmm. follow all the, you know, the, the elements, yeah. um, they're, they work really well together. The style that I practice is much more about, um, partnering with the nervous system and how the brain kind of views the body. And so mm-hmm. because of what I do, because I specialize in pain and sports medicine, that particular style works really well, but I can, I can always draw upon, you know, channel theory and five element theory to add a couple extra points to balance yeah. out the energetics. Right. You know, so having that understanding of that, the, um, the energetic, the yin and yang pairs and the relationships and all the patterns, it really helps me like really fine tune yeah. the treatment. So we know what to do, how to do it and what homework to give yeah. uh, in terms of nutrition and really, mindset and meditation. Like it really and, helps you surround the dragon like you were talking ex- about on the weekend. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. That's interesting. It's so um, cool. That yeah, that's that's I I like that. Um, man, yeah, I mean, it has you know me. I've always been interested in Chinese medicine. Like one of these days, I just probably should start learning it officially. <laughs> but, yeah. Um, until now, I just call you and I have questions. But that's really interesting. There you go. And I think absolutely, that's like, it kind of reminded me too of like that's such a big misnomer too of like the oh, the whole conversation between acupuncture and dry needling. Like oh. Yeah, this is when I get so frustrated when I'm like, yeah, they are not the same thing. <laughs> like, they're same not tool, totally different thought process. And it's like, yeah, yeah, I know how to use a needle for dry needling to get the physiological response of the needle, which is why I'm using that tool and certain mm-hmm. spots. But I'm like, man, that is like, you know, it's sort of. <laughs> I don't, I don't know what the right analogy is, bringing a knife to a gunfight. Like, it's like, there's so much more you could do with it. There's yeah. just so much more to Chinese medicine than acupuncture. Than yeah, it's an, it's an entire system of medicine. It is so right. deep and vast that equating the two is just, I think, I feel yeah, like it's like, disrespectful. I don't even know. It's like comparing apples and oranges. Like, they're yeah. Like, you can't. Now, there is a lot of crossover, right? From the, you know, from the patients, from the, you know, someone who doesn't know the difference, they, it looks very similar, 100%. but it yeah. looks very, same tool. Like if a patient closes their eyes and I needle them as an acupuncturist and somebody else needles them as a dry needler, the yeah. patient's body's not going to know who's who. I mean, I'm going to know who's who because the well, acupuncturists yeah. usually have the better, better technique. <laughs> well, a lot we, get, of time. we get we get more practice yeah. more practice we do yeah. we get more practice it ultimately like, there's some acupuncturists that don't have good needling technique that's true You're i right. mean it, it does I come down in every you know in not every field uh, yeah good, in every field yeah it comes down to the skill of the practitioner yeah. i i've spent years honing my my needling technique and i yeah. i still i still practice and yeah. uh you know there there is there's an art to it there's a, it's mm-hmm. not just point and tap you know sure. um there's, there's a, there's intent and there's purpose behind it. Yeah. And, you know, the way that you insert the needle, whether, I mean, you can insert one needle in the same point, but do it on a, on a transverse angle as a, right. as opposed to perpendicular you and you'll get a completely different, different result, yeah. you know? Well, so that's the, too, like how I use dry needling sometimes too, is like not mm-hmm. even how I learned dry needling. I use it yeah. based on my what I feel in my hand on my assessment with the mm-hmm. osteopathic and I just use the needle as an extension of my hand like to Beautiful. direct a very specific precise treatment somewhere yeah versus you know how you use it or like even like right. the whole system so yeah when I when people mm-hmm. come to me and I if I do dry needling on them I'm always very like hey this is not acupuncture this is not the same this is it's the same tool it's this a, is mm-hmm. like 
I'm like, and there's, there's some value crossover. in both. Now, there's very much value in both. And, you know, there's, can we talk about this for a second? Let's just, can we just dive into it? Because I think this is an important conversation that isn't being had widely. Yeah. Um, because there's, there's always been a lot of conflict between the two disciplines, right? Acupuncturist versus whoever's doing dry needling. Like right. it's this competition. And I think acupuncturists have been, you know, they, they feel like their territory is being threatened, right? Yeah. Because we're using the same tools and all the things and it looks similar and, you know, mm -hmm. um, and I feel like one, like, Acupuncture has been around for thousands of years. Yeah. It's so deep and so vast. I keep saying that, but it's true. It's like it has withstood the test of time. It has right. withstood like the evolution of humanity and science. And here yeah. we are, like we're yeah. still rocking mm -hmm. in the modern world. Even just in the last 100 years, mm -hmm. acupuncture is still around with all the advancements yeah. that we've had in technology and all the things, right? So like I find it really hard to believe that a small subset of clinicians doing dry needling is going to be the thing that takes us out. I agree. You know, and like, also, and also too, like not just, not just the, you know, people doing dry needling, but like how common now is cupping and gua sha yes. and like Isn't that true? so many traditional Chinese medicine practices now that are now not just mainstream in sports medicine and physical therapy mm -hmm. and um, massage therapy, but are mainstream in beauty and like like how many yes. influences do you see on a regular basis on social Getting media facials. like with the guisha on the face and the oh, yeah oh, yeah right? i think that's great i think i you I, know i like, like, i think it's fantastic and i do think that dry needling can be a great uh like springboard into acupuncture mm -hmm. right so if as the acupuncturist i think if we can develop better relationships with the sports medicine world right yeah. the physical therapists the chiropractors the athletic trainers like i feel like we can bring a lot to the table that's just oh being yeah open. for sure it's they're being bypassed because there's this conflict between yeah. the two like i do and feel, and I do feel like sue falsonia does such a great job of like trying to bring mm -hmm. those communities together and so it's it's really yeah great to see that and um yeah you know, I'm, um, I, I'm working out of a, a physical therapy clinic here yeah. now. I, I operate my acupuncture practice out of a PT clinic. And there's a guy, there's one of their therapists that does dry needling. And you know what? We get along just fine. Yeah. You know? Like, and you know what? Our patients are getting better. And so a patient who, who, might be, um, who might be open to dry needling and they have a positive experience, well, they, that might open the door to acupuncture later on. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so I think like it just, um, well, and then you too, know, like, which might open the door for them to like consider some emotional things and consider some like non-physical things. Yes. Order. And that's so, so important. Like tapping into the, all the unseen aspects of the body, uh, that acupuncture does so well that, yes. you know, conventional physical therapy, just, they don't do that kind of yeah. work. And it, you know, it's just, and well, and it's I okay. think it goes back to what we started with, right? Like mm -hmm. when you have a patient-centered model, it you, you it makes sense. It makes sense. You don't care yeah. who you're bringing in to help you because you realize you need more help to surround the person and, and yeah. like truly put them first. So yeah, that is like at the end of, and the whole argument too with the the turf wars. I'm always like, there are 39 billion. <laughs> How many billion? How many? In, a lot. In There's California a lot. Alone. In California alone, yeah. 39 million, billion? Either way, I don't, I don't know how many zeros it is. It's 39 something with a lot of zeros. And it's more right. than thousands. And so uh -huh. I mean, there are plenty of patients. There are mm -hmm. plenty of people in pain that need all of the practitioner support. They need, we like, need to, yeah. If, if you feel like you're not ha having patients, it's not because of people using the same tool as you it's because you need nope. to be, get better period we need to well we need to we need to put our egos down and yeah. start advocating for this beautiful medicine of ours exactly. and we need to, we need to you know if if that happens like if we get like boxed out by the dry needlers like that's our fault <laughs> we have no one to blame but ourselves because we didn't right. advocate enough yeah. you know and, yeah you have an opportunity to be like this is why we're different this is why yeah. we're better this is why yeah. you're, well, you know, whatever you want to say, it doesn't even matter. Like, but you have an opportunity to speak up. 
this is yeah. what we bring to the table. Like everybody has a seat at the table yeah, as far as I'm sure. concerned, you know, and, and there's a lot that we bring and a lot yeah. of it, you know, it, it, it's, it's not easy to, uh, explain, right. When we say things like surrounding the dragon and liver young rising and like, you know, yeah. all these, like Good these word. terms that sound, um, ancient because they are, it's, yeah. it's not easy, but this is what we signed up for. We didn't yeah. become acupuncturists knowing that it was going to be easy. Like right. it's an uphill battle. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of education that, that we have to bring to the table to yeah. the public and to other practitioners too. And, uh, like you said, like it's that patient centered model that matters. Like let's get our patients better. Yeah. And there's, there's a lot that, um, both disciplines can bring Yeah. for, you know, anyway. So that was a good rant. Good job. <laughs> good rant. Yeah. Good soapbox. <laughs> I mean, um, yeah. I want to, before we end, because we are getting towards the end, because, you know, I don't yeah. like to have super long podcasts. I'm not joking uh -huh. or anything. Like, I like, know. <laughs> I, don't even, not, the reason why I, I mean, we could like, keep going. Can't. We could go for yeah, three we hours. Could. We could. We could. We'll just have to do multiple episodes. Yeah. But, right. you know, to go back to the Chinese organ clock real quick, because I do refer mm. to that quite a bit when I talk yeah. about the visual organs. And um, I see it becoming more popular on social media, too, which I love. Um, mm -hmm. but I think there is a fundamental misunderstanding of it, of, and, and you kind of started talking about it because you talked about how each organ, you know, has a certain time of day where its energy is increasing, you know, where it is like getting more energy directed towards it. And so like, you know, mm -hmm. again, to continue with the liver as an example, so it's like the high energy time for the liver is between 1am and 3am. So oftentimes yes. like if people find themselves waking up consistently around those hours, it is, you know, something to consider that maybe their liver is either stagnant like down in the beginning, like too much energy or not enough energy, like something's mm -hmm. out of balance there. And so mm -hmm. like figuring out what it is, like, could you, could you speak to that? Cause I think like, um, I think sometimes people always see the negative side of things like, oh, I'm waking up at one to three, like, oh, there's something wrong in my liver where I'm like, well, it might not be that. It's just maybe it's you know, like you it's, said, the opposite organs that are not supporting, you know, like, supporting it. Yeah. It so sure. Yeah. So it it means that something somewhere along the way isn't having its needs met. Whenever we have a symptom of some kind, whatever it yeah. is, something in the system is not having its needs met. And so waking up between one and 3 a.m., yeah, like I'm going to look at your, your, your liver patterns. And right. oftentimes it's a liver excess. It's too much stress. It's overthinking. It's, you know, well, that's, that's uh, you know, the spleen will get into that too. The spleen energy will, will play into that too. But yeah. um, nothing ever works alone. And that's true with Chinese medicine too. Yeah. Right? Like, the waking up between one and three is just the way that your body's getting your attention. Start yeah. with the liver, start with the liver and gallbladder because that's the time when it's most active. But what else is happening? What's your digestion like? Again, what, what are your mindsets like? What is your daily? Are you active? Are you not active? Are you, are you recovering too much? I don't know yeah. if you can recover too much. Yeah. Uh, are you underactive? Are you not active enough? Or are you overtrained? Do you need to rest more, right? Like where where are your imbalances and where what needs are you not meeting? Right. Um, and so waking up between that one and three, it's again, it's just like any other symptom. It's just getting your attention, letting you know that something somewhere needs something that it's not yeah. getting. Yeah, that's it. Mm -hmm. What I think too, like what ends up happening is people are really aware of the nighttime organ energies because it does mm -hmm. wake you up. Whereas like, they're not mm -hmm. as mindful of like noticing patterns throughout the day when you're awake. So I remember an acupuncturist I used to work with, um, back in the day here in Arizona, she would ask me questions and we realized like every day at four o'clock, I would like have some burping and like, cons like, like regurge. I would, mm -hmm. it was almost like, I burped in the afternoon and I was like, Oh, four o'clock. Four o'clock. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like let, no, again, I'm going back to observate observations, right? Like noticing mm -hmm. like, it's just not 
it's not something that's going to be as striking as waking you up at night. It might be something as subtle as like burping every day. Yeah. At the time. Right. Um, and the, using the bathroom too, like how often yeah. you're using the bathroom too, like, right. So like first thing in the morning, a lot of times people have a bowel movement, mm -hmm. right? Right. So again, lung and large intestine, stomach, spleen, right, yeah, right around that breakfast time, like right, like right around the time people would be eating breakfast. That's when uh, you're going to be most active in those organ, in those meridians. It's again, it just follows, it follows the, uh, you know, the natural rhythm of the, the, how the day unfolds, right? The natural, uh, what else, oh, what was it? What, I, there was something else that fell out of my head. I just, as you were well, talking, I thought of something, it'll come back. It might not. Um, until it comes back, since yeah. we're getting towards the end of wrapping up, I do yeah. want you to share, like, you kind of said a little bit how you practice in your clinic is a little different mm -hmm. than these sort of more traditional Chinese medicine, like, views. Mm -hmm. um, and so share a little bit about that and then also share sort of like what you have for people out there, like where to find you yeah. and like if you have anything coming yeah, up. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Thanks. Yeah. So um, the style of acupuncture that I practice, it's, uh, I, it's distal needling. So there's two styles that fall under this category and it's called balance method mm -hmm. and master tongue, T-U-N-G. Mm -hmm. um, and these are entirely, uh, so the, the balance method uses points, uh, acupuncture points that are, uh, would, that would be considered primary points, just organized in a different way. Um, and then the master tongue system uses its own, it has a, its own sets of points. But the thing that I love about this particular style, and there, these are still, you know, these styles are a couple hundred years old. So mm -hmm. in the world of acupuncture, they're still, they're, they're fairly new. new. Um, but the reason I use them is because it, uh, it, it, they work instantly, right? We get instant feedback and it uses what we call, uh, you know, homologous structures to look at the body. So we look for structures that look like other structures. So for example, you know, the humerus and the femur, right? You hold them up side by side. Yeah. They look very, very similar, right? Mm -hmm. They're not identical, right? But they're similar enough to know that, oh, that you like, One's just bigger than the other, yeah. right? And if you follow the, the pattern, just the anatomical structure, like following, like again, the humerus and the, the femur, like we have a ball and socket on one end and then we have a hinge on the other in the knee and the elbow. Yeah. We go further down the limb, like to the tib and fib and to the radius and ulna, we have one solid bone and then a floater, Yeah. right? And then moving down, we have the hands and the feet. They're pretty much identical, mm -hmm. you know, for the most part. Yeah. And so- um, same bones. These are just organized a little differently, right? Um, so using, like, moving in opposition, right? The right limb, the right upper, the right arm will swing with the left arm and vice versa. I was, did I say that right? No, the left yeah. leg and right arm. Yeah. yeah. Did I say that right? They're opposing uh, joint. Yeah. Oppose it. Yeah, exactly. So whenever I'm treating, let's say, a sh you know, a right-sided shoulder, I'm going to look at the leg on the on the left side and I'm going to needle there. Why? Because there's no pain there. The, yeah. You know, the, the brain, like the, the brain, brain's going to protect something that hurts, right? Mm -hmm. It's going to protect it from an external source and, or an external yeah. fort, right? So if I go in with a sharp object, this is why I don't needle locally. I seldomly needle locally into a, a point of pain mm -hmm. because I know that there's going to be, there's going to be guarding here. There's right. going to be guarding around that area of pain. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to, I'm going to put a needle into like, here I come with a sharp object. Brain's going to be like, mm -mm. You're right. you know, I'm, I'm going to have to, you know, really work to earn the trust of the nervous system before the benefit really starts to settle in. But when I needle it's homologous structured partner, right? So if I needle the left leg to treat the right shoulder, we get instant results, mm -hmm. instant. Yeah. I think I think we've uh, we've demonstrated that in your clinic up in back when you were in Scottsdale. Yeah, probably. If I remember, yeah, yeah probably yeah. a bunch, right? Um, but we get instant results, and and it just it gives me an opportunity to apply any other modality that might be appropriate to the injured area. So if we can clear the pain first, well, then we can either do some movement or body work or whatever it is that you know the the area of pain is in need right. in, in need of. 
Or sometimes we just need to leave it alone. Just yeah. get the pain down and let the body do its thing on its own and just retain the, ne the needles for, you yeah. know, a short period of time. Yeah. Um, but this style of, of needling that I practice very much partners with the body itself. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, the results that I'm getting is just, it's incredible. And so, that. yeah, it's great. It's just, you know, you, you say this all the time. It's like your nervous system is the smartest thing in the room. Mm-hmm. Right. So why not use it? Like, why yeah. not partner with it and just encourage yeah. it to do what it does naturally? Yeah. Just Absolutely. by putting in these little needles and just give it a little bit of direction. Right. That's really all I'm doing. I love that. And uh, yeah, it's really. I mean, I could talk all day about distal needling. I won't. But, you know, that's uh, another that's my favorite thing. So day for another podcast. Yeah. Another day. No, we'll do that <laughs> another day. Um, um, but yeah, so. Um, yeah. I talk more about like nervous system stuff. I know you talk a lot about that, Anna. Mm -hmm. And um, I always, yeah, I always learn from you. Yeah. Oh, and uh, sure. it's great. But I have, uh, I have a master class that's out right now. It's uh, partnering with the nervous system. Mm -hmm. um, that's available on my website, uh, drsarah.net. And awesome. folks can, uh, if they're interested in following me more on Instagram, it's uh, at Dr. Sarah Azadorian. And I will link both of those things in the show notes. For everyone, uh, definitely check it out. Like I said, Sarah is one of my go-to practitioners that, for my own body, which is always like the biggest thing. Like I don't let anybody touch me, mm -hmm. but yep. I will which while you're them. here, let's get I you know, in. I'm here, I should come see you. I yeah. do need to see you actually. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, and then um, yeah. So she's my go-to for my own body, and then she's my go-to, like I said at the beginning, for when I need help and get stuck on a patient. And so, um, ten of ten recommend. Um, I think Thank I you. mean we covered a lot, obviously, and, and yeah. certainly this opens the door for more conversations. And mm -hmm. honestly, too, like you know, I am like a. I know you're starting to put more content out there, so I'm like, you mm -hmm. need to do a podcast. Too. I know, I know. I um, I'm I'm working with a um a media manager, yeah, and this is something that is on our agenda. I, I just have to say, you know, from a business standpoint, yes. anybody listening, podcast is, I should have done it five years ago. It's been the number one best thing in terms of nurturing my people and getting my people to learn more and get comfortable and like mm -hmm. show the world what is out there to learn and what I am teaching in my courses. And so I'm like, this is like, it seems like a big animal to do but it is mm -hmm. like one of the things that is paid off the most in terms of effort and my time and everything so well guess who's going to be my first guest on my podcast oh i would that, love to <laughs> whenever that's coming i don't have a date yet but yes i would love to yay so all right well thank you just you inspired me yeah good thank you for joining <laughs> me um yeah well well see everybody next week let me know how you liked it let sarah know how you liked this topic and we'll uh do more maybe in the future thanks thank you